Thank you, Wayne. Good morning, everybody. Um, today's speaker is Ed Martin, as you can see here by the uh, slide. And I want to talk a little bit, if I may, about the fact that Ed was here back in June 2012. And uh, for many of you sky birds, you missed his presentation. So he's back today, really, at a, a popular demand. I'm delighted we have such a full house uh, to hear him speak. Uh, Ed was a, a protectionist in the development and implementation of the GPS system. Uh, we don't need to tell guys our age it's a modern marvel. And we know it's success because the youth of today all seem to take it for granted. That's always a sign of being success. So, uh, a little bit about Ed's background. He was uh, educated at Ohio State University. In, 50, in 1957, he received a bachelor's uh, degree in electrical engineering, and then went on, by 1964, he had his master's degree in the same discipline. Uh, concurrent to that, he, uh, he served uh, in the U.S. Um, Air Force Reserve from 57 to 69, and also around that time he joined Hughes Aircraft Company. Later he joined uh, North American Aviation in the uh, Autonetics Division, uh, and that, in turn, was uh, acquired by Rockwell. In 72 to 78, he then went to Magnavox uh, Research Laboratory in Torrance, in California. Um, and later, he rejoined Rockwell uh, in their Collins Radio, which Boeing ultimately purchased. Now, all these consolidations, you remember, came to pass in the 90s when there was a tremendous uh, uh, merger activities in the defense industry. So. It seems to have uh, gone from one company to another, but in the end he stayed with, with uh, Boeing, who ultimately brought uh, Rockwell. He retired from Boeing in 1999, and he continued to consult privately with several companies, including Boeing Space Division, until his ultimate retirement in 2011. He's healthy, though, he's still busy, and he's still very much in touch uh, with uh, everybody at, um, uh, at, um, at, at, at Space uh, Command. Uh, so, I just quickly uh, will outline some of his awards. It could take me half a day to, to uh, run through this list, but here's a, a few of his recognitions. Um, he was one of the identified members of the Rockwell team when they received the Collier Trophy in 1992. Uh, he received the uh, President's Team Award uh, uh, from Rockwell in 1994. He uh, had uh, a reward, uh, an award from Boeing, uh, the Technical Fellow Recognition Award. Uh, in 1998. He received the Boeing uh, Accolade Award for GPS Modernization Study in 1999. Uh, the Captain P. V. H. Williams Award for Navigation Contribution in 2010. Uh, and the GPS World Magazine GPS Heroes Award of September 2010. And the list goes on. Uh, and he tells me come Sunday night he's probably going to receive an Oscar as well. So <laughs> let me, uh, let me uh, welcome uh, Ed Martin. Come on over. I'm glad to be back, uh, living out here in the desert, uh, up to a little bit remote from all my friends, but uh, I really, one thing I've always enjoyed is the people I've worked with, and I have a lot of friends that have really helped me. Hey, well, let's get started. I'm going to be talking about the old time, 57 years ago. Anybody here not born in 1957? <laughs> hey, I'm going to try to encapsulate about 57 years of activity in about 35 minutes. Uh, this is basically my, my entry into the business world, and it was my uh, basic honor to graduate in 1957 with a class of uh, about 2,163 2, people. I didn't count them in Ohio State State. This is in a book written by uh, Philip Roth. And it's a little novel, and the quote is from him. About, Someday I will return. I had the benefit of returning about two years ago. Uh, the real beginning, I think, of all satellite navigation happened in October 1957. If any of you went outside that night and looked up in the sky 
about every 90 minutes you saw a little light come over. And that was basically a, uh, a threat to us in the Cold War, the Russians had usurped our technology and launched the first artificial satellite and went around the world with it. Uh, that led to a, a lot of changes. There was a big emphasis eventually in going to space. Uh, NASA became created. Eisenhower uh, formulated a lot of technical initiatives, and one of which was eventually Bush Missile t uh, Division becoming much more significant. Uh, as a result of that, two scientists at uh, John Hopkins decided to record the information. It was a very simple signal, operating at 20 megahertz with a thousand hertz tone on it. If you put it on a recording, you ended up getting a signal that came anywhere from 750 up to 1500 tone changed frequency. And you could listen to it. You tuned it with a, a regular pattern, uh, 20 megahertz receiver, you could hear the tone and the tone change. And what they decided to do was to record that and then try to work backwards and figure out what is the orbit of the satellite from the information on the Doppler. And that led to a <coughs> That led to a lot of technological changes that happened in terms of satellite navigation. Uh, in 1957, that was a what we call the International Geophysical Year. And we ended up trying to do science that was going to last all the way through 1958. And as a result of that, one of the things that happened was we set a submarine underneath the North Pole with an inertial navigation system. First time that was ever done. It's one of our atomic submarines. Uh, additionally, in 1959, people at, at uh, John Hopkins reversed the problem. They said, we can tell what the satellite ephemeris is. We know kind of where we are. And we have the information of the ephemeris. We can predict where we are anywhere else in the world. So they inverted the problem so we can navigate using a satellite in terms of just measuring the change in the tone as it goes over. That system was implemented eventually uh, in the, uh, by the Navy. It, it became operational. It was used for updating the position of our satellite or our, our strategic ballistic missile submarine weapons. It became a, 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 a military weapon. We did all that in about <coughs> 10 years. And eventually, in 1967, I was so much interested in navigation using satellites that it was approved for use by the civilians as a transit system. So in 10 years, we went from military aiding weapons of mass destruction, if you will, to civilian usage on <coughs> maritime tankers operating all across the world. The uh, transit itself was fairly simple. <coughs> six, six satellites operating over the pole. Uh, the orbit period was about 90 minutes. The only problem with them from a military viewpoint was the fact that their accuracy was only about 40 to 50 meters of accuracy. So that's about like half a football field. Now that's fine for navigation on, on a, uh, a sea level ship, but it didn't really work very well for anything to do with aircraft. Okay, the other problem being if you flew an aircraft and you had any kind of velocity, it kind of louses up the measurement of the Doppler. In fact, you have to really aim accurately with your velocity to really navigate with an aircraft. So from the viewpoint of an Air Force person, I didn't think it was a very good weapon system. Uh, I ended up at White Patterson about 1959 through 64. And one of the things we ended up really worrying about at that time was obviously the war in Vietnam, counterinsurgency, and our inability to deliver accurate weapons, especially across the digit bridges in Vietnam. So bombing became a big thing with the people at Wright Patterson. Uh, in California at the Aerospace Corporation, they started a study to try to find a new satellite navigation approach. That was initiated in 1964 under Ivan Getty at the Aerospace Corporation. Uh, they came and asked Wright Patterson, what 
would be looking for for requirements. And the message that came back said basically weapon delivery, three-dimensional, accurate within meters, all worldwide, and passed them. And that challenge was laid on their doorstep to come up with a new system design. Uh, the DOD in 1968 had a problem. Uh, as a result of the entry into space, we had a competition between the Air Force, Navy, and the Army. Okay? Everybody after Sputnik wanted to get into space, everybody wanted to launch satellites. And that started a humongous rivalry that I think still exists today. Okay? So what happened in 68, the DOD had a problem. Everybody wanted to go into space, and they wanted to build satellites, and it was very expensive. So they said, let's, let's form a committee called NAVSEG to try to sort out this, if you will, tri-service competition. And possibly, if we could, come up with one system, with funding for one system, that solved all the military problems in terms of navigation, location, weapon delivery. That was a large objective. Uh, as it turns out, they funded a lot of what I call analyses. Uh, nothing really got done, we did a lot of paper. In fact, we call that paralysis by analysis. Okay. Uh, the one thing we did do eventually, uh, we had some money left over in about 1970, and TRW had gotten involved, and they said, why don't we do a demonstration? Why don't we actually build a prototype system and test it? And we tried to do that and actually had very much success doing that at White Sands in 1971 to 72. And what we did was we created a ground system of what we call satellites on the ground, and then flew aircraft over them and tried to measure how accurate they would be. And lo and behold, in 1972, using a, a fairly new technology called pseudo-random noise modulation, we came up with a system that we could predict errors probably within less than five meters while we're flying dynamically <coughs> and maneuvering. Okay, this is a statement out of what was at one time the classified study. And as I pointed out, the most critical thing we were trying to do was accurate weapon delivery and tactical aircraft maneuver. 0.56 Gs, maybe doing toss dives or whatever they wanted to do. And if we could design a system that would then meet the needs of the Army, the Navy, and all the three services. Okay, this had never been done. <laughs> We had never had a joint program. In fact, when, when I was reading Aviation Week, the, the, the statements in there always were, well, nobody's going to ever be able to do a joint program. It's just not ever possible. Don't try to go there. Uh, the study said we, I don't think, the study said, well, we, we should go there. And they laid out some what could be. Uh, this was a, sort of a, what can be done in terms of navigation with satellites. And the requirements kind of went around saying, well, we'd like to have something that could be active, something to signal up to a satellite, get information back down the range that way. Or, or we could do a system where we, in effect, have a, a signal on the ground sent to a satellite, and the users only look at the signal and do not emit anything. Because so that was critical. You didn't want to go flying around and say, hey, I'm here, I'm here. So we wanted to be passive, and there's a few other two-way options in one way. What we really focused on eventually uh, was a passive system, and there was going to be ground stations that transmitted to accurate time and timing to a satellite, which then came down to a user who either had an atomic clock or a crystal clock. Okay, atomic clock on military systems would be expensive. So we kind of eventually said, if we find a way to do it with a crystal clock, put the clock maybe on the ground, and lo and behold, the real idea was, can we put the clock in the satellite? Okay, that was the challenge. Uh, this is a picture of the receiver built by Magnavox in 1970-71. It was tested at White Sands. Uh, it was about like 12 inches by 15 had five channels to be able to look at five signals. And one of, the, one of the channels was dedicated to figuring out the bias of these channels because we didn't want errors between each of the satellites to be built in the equipment. So we had five channels to calibrate each one inside the box. 
and look at four satellites or signals at the same time. Uh, and we built this at Mangalox for $450,000. Okay, <laughs> that's unheard of today. But the caveat was, and, and the boss I worked for was very shrewd. Arthur Stewart said, we will sell the box for testing, but we will keep the box after we're done testing. And that's what we did. Uh, I came into all this <laughs> from a different kind of a viewpoint. <laughs> As I said, I graduated from Ohio State in double A. Uh, I actually was in pilot option. I got my commission in 1957 with my degree. I got married. I also didn't have a job because I was supposed to go into the uh, pilot training at Blackman. But in 1958, I think it was class in March 1958. So here I am, I got nine months, nothing to do. So I, I wrote a letter to several people in California and said, hey, would you like to hire me for nine months? <laughs> the only people that responded was Hughes Aircraft. They said, hey, you've got a clearance? Come on down. He said, what do you want to do? Is I want to fly in the Air Force to be a test pilot. He said, you're working on the test line with us on the F-102. He said, they're coming up from San Diego. We're going to be installing missile guidance systems, MG-10. Why don't you go down and fly it and see if you can help anybody? So I spent basically six months working on the 102 <coughs> flight line, getting green airplanes up from San Diego and checking out the new electronics and the power supplies. Uh, at about January, right after the Rose Bowl, which we won, by the way, <laughs> 1958, uh, I got a letter from the Air Force saying we got too many pilots. I said, what would you want to do? You want to sign up as a regular officer? Or would you just want to go and, in effect, complete your three-year duty cycle? And I said, I don't know what I want to do. I went to see a, uh, a very friendly lieutenant colonel that was in the uh, office where they gave security clearances. So we sat down and talked. He says, you know, he said, with the satellite thing that went up, in your background, he said, you probably don't want to become a test pilot. He said, we got too many young guys that will go out there and do the craziest thing that you can do. He said, you're probably better off right now, career-wise, to stick with engineering, work here at Hughes, if you can, until they ask you to go into service. If you go into service, ask for an assignment in research at Wright-Patterson. So that way you can go to Wright-Patterson and, and in fact go to Affleck or go to Ohio State and get your master's degree. So with my wife being pregnant, <laughs> we made a decision that I would in effect switch over and ask for assignment as a research engineer, which I did. I went to Dayton, Ohio. I was there for four years active duty. Uh, I started my master's and ended up working as a GS-13 eventually by the time I got my master's degree. And at that time I was uh, working for a very small group at Wright-Patterson called Systems and Analysis. System Analysis uh, in effect services. And I said, well that's kind of a strange thing. <coughs> I said, if you do, analysis comes first and then synthesis comes later. I said, he said, how come we didn't call it analysis and synthesis? The guy said, it'll be ASS. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I worked uh, basically on the, uh, at that time, the uh, <coughs> TFX, which was coming out and they competed with uh, Boeing <coughs> and also with General Dynamics. And uh, we were the ones at Wright-Patterson saying, hey, go with Boeing. <laughs> Don't go with General Dynamics. As it turned out, at that time, uh, I think it was uh, President Johnson was president, and we ended up building the F-111 at GD. And my basic uh, job was arguing with, uh, at that time, uh, the people in Washington on why that was a wrong decision, but so be it. But anyway, I had a good background on the, on the F-111. And with that, uh, as I got my master's, I had asked some of my Air Force friends, I said, where's a good place to go to learn about virtual navigation? I knew about radar, I knew about electronics. The one weakness I had is I didn't have a good background in inertial, which is one of the fundamentals for navigating for most of the military aircraft at that time. So I ended up taking a job in North America to work on inertial systems. Moved out to California. 
uh, ended up working as an applied research engineer. Now, with applied research, it's kind of a funny thing. You know, if you steal from one person, that's plagiarism. Applied research allows you to go and steal from everybody. <laughs> you then look at the best ideas and put them together and answer them. Like that. So that's applied research. <laughs> and I, we did a, uh, a, a basic set of the designs for the F-111, C-5, and the F-15. Uh, for the F-111, I did a, a, a basic integration called a thing called the Kalman filter. I don't know if you ever heard of Kalman. It's named after Rudy Kalman, a person. And what it basically is a way for predicting and controlling errors in the combined system, or even in standalone systems if you have an initial knowledge of conditions. So I applied that to the F-111 for the Doppler radar for penetration over water. And that was the Mark II avionic system, which about two years ago finally went out. The aardvark is gone. The F-111 is no longer flying. But that made my reputation. At that point, I got a visibility in the company. Uh, I worked on all the C5 F15 inertial systems, which we did not win, and I was getting frustrated. So I was looking around for something that really interests me, and I had three bosses Blair Bona, Tom DeVries, and Tom Dunkel. Tom Dunkel eventually became vice president of Net. Uh, Tom was my immediate boss, and he was the one that basically ended up designing the Keynes inertial navigation landing system. Carried. Uh, Blair Bona was my uh, upper supervisor, and that's where I learned everything about Kalman filtering more, and also about state space analysis. Uh, <coughs> what, what Tom did, Dr. Gumpel said, why don't you go off and do a research program for us, we'll fund you, <coughs> figure out some way of combining Loran, TACAN, Omega, airborne radar, Doppler, whatever you want, <coughs> into a universal processor and use that combined with an inertial system for navigating. I said, okay, I'll try that. <laughs> it turns out that at the investigation, I came across 621B. And what I looked at and using my analysis program said, hey, there's no sense in using Omega. There's no sense in using Loran. They have to bounce off the ionosphere. They're not that accurate eventually. The system 621, if it does five meters or better, that's what I want for bombing. There's the answer. Now that can be global. Okay. And not only that, there'll be satellites that are pretty invulnerable to attack. The only thing that's a, a liability is a control system. So I tried some of those numbers and said, hey, this is the thing to do. And I went up to Tom and said, forget all this. I'm going to go off and start doing some phase uh, tracking stuff and figure out exactly what the limits are on this. And we're gonna, I think we ought to pursue this activity. They went up the chain, they came back and said, I don't think we want to do that. We're selling very expensive navigation systems, inertial navigation. It's 150,000, 200,000. If we buy cheap receivers and use that to update them, our market's going to go to hell. <laughs> and I said, well, that's the case, though. That's where we're going. They said, well, right now, we're, we're not interested. So I said, oh, OK. I look for a new job. I went to Aviation Week, I found out Magnavox a global receiver. I interviewed at Magnavox, they said, hey, we'll put you in charge of our military navigation system. Uh, we'll give you three guys to work all the proposals. <coughs> the customers in the Naval Research Lab with Roger Eastman, uh, the Air Force 621B program office and XR plans. And we'll let you work with our chief scientist, Charlie Kahn, and see what you can do. So I said, hey, that sounds great. So I went off to Torrance, although I still lived in Anaheim. <laughs> Always cover your bets. <laughs> okay? Uh, and I, I left in 72. And November 1972, a young lieutenant, Brad Parkinson, was assigned to 6.1B. This is the old Brad Parkinson. He's now a professor emeritus at Stanford. Uh, Brad uh, had a almost identical career although he was in the military. So I, oh, I kind of gauged where he went versus where I went. <laughs> Two different paths. Brad ended up graduating from the Naval Academy. Okay, but he entered the service into the Air Force. Okay, he chose that path. Because he said, the Air Force probably is a better route for what I want to do eventually. 
and get, getting a PhD. <coughs> so he ended up graduating from the uh, Naval Academy, got his master's at MIT on model reference adaptive flight control, and eventually a PhD at Stanford in 1966. And he ended up coming into uh, the project office with General uh, uh, Schultz at that time, assigned him, uh, uh, unknown to him, as the program manager, even though he didn't guarantee that he would be the lead program manager for the program. But Brad, in effect, took that job and did very well. In fact, he's still, still doing very well. Uh, the challenge he had was to put together a purple team, okay? No Navy, no Army, no Air Force identifications. We brought in all three service people. He went out and found the best captains in the Air Force and the best captains in the Navy, but he got a major from the Army, <laughs> which probably was a good thing. The major was really good. Anyway, all the people that he ended up finding in the Air Force were all my customers. I, went, I, had, I had customers at the Central uh, Inertial Test Facility at Holloman, uh, Captain Mel Gerbaum. My customer at Wright-Patterson 666 Inertial Office was uh, Hal Shoemaker. Uh, the, the group of people that I uh, knew from Fort Monmouth came and worked with me as the FAA representative eventually. So I felt kind of comfortable. <laughs> Uh, there was a lot of competition on this thing. Uh, Brad, uh, in effect, took over as director, and he did a very, very great job of leadership. Outstanding. And he was somebody that you could always, in effect, talk to. Uh, he, he came in, uh, listened to everybody, listened to all the right people, and made his own decision. The first decision he really made was to try to push what was the, the 621B concept uh, through a DSART in August of 1973. That was unsuccessful. The reason being, the 621B, again, focused on geosatellites, on the assumption that we had a, a capability, we had a lot of people that were making those, especially Hughes aircraft. So we said, let's use geosatellites and, in effect, put them at locations around the world in groups of four, at least 12, around the world to cover it and also then use that system to navigate the world. Uh, it didn't fly. The, the, Navy, the Navy objected because they were trying to push an advanced transit at low altitudes with lots of satellites instead of only 12 flying around with the FX-16 Navy. So it was a big argument and the net result was politically he couldn't solve the program. Uh, but one of the uh, assistant secretaries of the Air Force, Mal Curry, said, come back and try it again but get some consensus between all you people. And that was tough to do. But Brad managed to do that. Came back uh, basically over the Labor Day weekend, re redesigned the concept for now lower altitude. In fact, we ended up 12 hour orbits, but about half synchronous altitude, no longer going to the set. Which means you don't need as big a rock to get up there to. Uh, and 24 satellite configuration, 12 hour orbit, and started writing a, comp a set of proposals for competing that between, uh, if you will, three segments. Okay, there's going to be a satellite segment, there's going to be a user segment, and then we had a control segment that would be on the ground. But the big thing he did was put the clock in the satellite. Okay, that eliminated all the problems of trying to go up and transfer that information up there. Put the clock in the satellite, let it transmit down, be monitored on the ground, figure out the affirmative upload, and the user simply passive listening. Okay, the risk was you make the clock in the satellite that lasts long and exists in a 12 hour orbit, which is the Van Allen belt. That, the worst place you can go. The big issue was not only putting the number of satellites and their altitude and picking the frequencies, but actually defining in detail what are you going to transmit down to the user. And these three people right here, you may have never heard of, but they're the three geniuses that I work with. And I'll say these are geniuses. Uh, Dr. Stoker, Dr. Ch Dr. Charlie Kahn, and Dr. Robert Gould. Uh, Robert Gold invented the waveforms that we use, the coding, 
1967. And that was open publishing. There was no patents. He just, this was his contribution. He defined the nature of the coding signal. Uh, he also worked in many blocks. Dr. Khan and Jim were <coughs> charged with putting some kind of concepts to actually make it work. Uh, it turns out that uh, we had a choice between three different short codes and how, what kind of information we would put on it and how often we would, in effect, transmit that. <coughs> this is as technical as I'm going to get. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but this is all the G whiz numbers for the engineers. Anyway, we created was two signals, a clear signal for civil people, a protected signal for military people. The clear signal was short, it's only 10, 23 bits or changes. Uh, the, the P signal is extremely long, it's about 279 days, almost three quarters of a year. Uh, but what we do is we short cycle it to a seven day interval. Each satellite transmits a piece of a seven day of a long, long code. Uh, and th these little symbols here are what I call the symbols that in effect were transmitted. But what they really are, the little block changes are when we flipped phase on, these, on the signal's carrier signal. We will transmit a, a positive set of sequences and then a negative set of sequences. This is just called, I call bit, bit flipping. Okay, binary phase shift key, which means you do it two ways and you simply shift the phase. So these little intervals were lots of carrier cycles. In fact, for a P signal, this is about 154 carrier cycles for any one shift. Uh, the power level, the power levels were like 160, uh, minus 160 dBW. <coughs> Who's that mean? <laughs> that says it's 10 times 10 times 10, like 16 times 10 as a reciprocal. So it's like 1 billion, billion, billion of a watt. <laughs> okay? That's about the energy in a fly walking up the wall. Okay? It's also about 20 dB below thermal noise. Okay? What is thermal noise? It's thermal noise is what you, if you look in the sky with a, a microwave receiver, it comes out to be a minus four degrees Kelvin, okay, which is extremely nothing. But it's there. There's a background noise, and two people have discovered that basically in 1964, got a Nobel Prize for it. Because that signal in the background noise that the satellite has to operate against is <laughs> the actual remnants of the Big Bang, for which they got a Nobel Peace Prize. So we're operating 20 dB below <coughs> the Big Bang noise. But we, because of our processing that we have, what we call time bandwidth, process a lot of information, a lot of information in these signals, because they operate at either one hertz, or one megahertz, or ten megahertz. A lot of data, a lot of information. You compress it all, bring it down. You can recreate the data of range. You can actually range very accurately on these bit edges by doing it early in the late track. Okay, but that's about as big as it is. The, the other issue was. Well, how, how long the code to acquire? <clears throat> the acquisition was critical <clears throat> for time of first fix. <clears throat> the time of first fix of 100 seconds was too much. Uh, the 25 seconds was not enough to separate the signals from each other. And we ended up picking 103, 1023. And that defined all of these, all of the characteristic frequencies and sequences. Everything was time harmonic. Everything cycled together. No bits to keep track of. It was like a harmonic operation. And that was the contribution of both Stoker, right there, Jim Stoker, who ended up, he worked at Philco Ford, eventually started his own company called Stanford Tell. Uh, Charlie had a, a competing system that went with 2047, <coughs> but it, it actually had a time share, which we didn't want to do in the military system. We wanted, we wanted to share signals with the, the civil and the military. Uh, Jim had a scheme where we, in effect, had a separate military and a quadrature civil. So, in effect, they didn't interfere. And, and they, as a matter of fact, they were also different powers. Okay, that's the, that's the technology. Uh, there was then a phase one contract that was awarded out of the joint program. Uh, the, the winning competitor was Rockwell International Space Division, which was a, had never built a satellite. Okay. We had Hughes, the big, big giant in there. We had TRW, 
Uh, we had Philco Ford. We had RCA who built the transit. Uh, I team with Rockwell. <laughs> As it turned out, we, we ended up winning the contract. But Dick Schwartz did an outstanding job of creating a team of excuse people <laughs> and brought them down to Seagull Beach and developed the Phase 1 satellite award. Uh, we got a total, initially a contract for four. Uh, the total contract ended up delivering 11 vehicles, uh, the last five of which were used for other missions, especially for including packages on nuclear detection. Uh, being global and flying around the world was an outstanding way to have something in space to monitor atomic bomb explosions. <coughs> That's still a mission for the GPS. The big job that Rockwell did very well, I take no credit for this, uh, was putting together a team of people that actually developed and funded all the activity of atomic clock. Okay, atomic clock right, is, is not, it's not radiation, it's not a radiation thing. It simply looks at changes of states of little electrons, but very, very critically accurate. Uh, the problem that we had uh, was try to keep the error buildup of a clock over one day down to about uh, 10 nanoseconds. Okay. About 10 nanoseconds of error. You didn't want to be more than 10 nanoseconds. 10 nanoseconds was basically about uh, three meters. Okay, we didn't want the clock to ever drift more than two meters per day because we would load, upload it every day. Uh, what that said was, if you have that much accuracy in nanoseconds, and that many seconds of viewing over, you gotta have like one part of 10 to the 13th accuracy stability. Okay, these are small numbers. <laughs> uh, as it turns out, we, we end up sponsoring with the Navy, the Naval Research Lab, uh, the development of a rubidium clock and eventually a season. The rubidiums that we tested in Delta Phase 1 were of about two parts times 10 to the minus 13. The cesium ended up being much more accurate, about 1 to 10 to 13. But the challenge here was taking a, these were atomic clocks that were in, in effect large chassis, shrinking them down with our microelectronics, and then packaging them so they weren't affected by either temperature or magnetic fields, or electric fields, or anything else. They're very, very sensitive instruments. In fact, they're better thermometers than anything else. Uh, that development then, in effect, was utilized on phase one. Uh, this is the phase one satellite. It's a half ton in space. Uh, and this, the part of that problem was the, uh, we actually had a injection engine that we had to carry along with us to, in effect, in service in the track orbit. Uh, very nice, simple design. Uh, this was the payload area. This is where the antenna put in the earth. These are all electronic packages. Uh, the uh, cooling of the device is through radiators up on the side to space, which is very cool. And these are the solar rays that rotated and kept track of the pointing of the sun. Uh, this was about a $25 million per satellite job. Okay, we ended up delivering 11 of those. Uh, <coughs> Here's the history of them. We launched, actually, if you count one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. So what happened to number 11? Well, between six and eight, we lost seven. The Atlas booster had a failure, and we went in the Atlantic. Uh, the rest of these, though, had a very long life. Uh, they ended up being launched in about 1985. They, they were operational all the way through the Desert Storm uh, war, and were actually utilized at that point in time. We only had 16 eventual satellites to operate with. Uh, the other interesting part was here, one, two, three, four, five satellites before, uh, I think, what, April of 1980. Uh, this one's launched after. The reason for that I'm gonna point out is, uh, I was asked to give a briefing for the Air Force in Munich in 1980. And in April 1980, I was on the podium of describing all these, if you will, systems to NATO people. And I got a fellow came up to the podium and said, Ed, here's a note. And I looked at it and said, we just lost a crew of people trying to rescue some of the hostages in Iran. <laughs> I said, I told the guy, I said, go back, call Chicago, ask them where the satellites were at that time. And guess what? They were over terror Okay? 
So they were being utilized for that mission called Eagle Claw. Uh, the equipment that we ended up building in phase one, uh, basically it was awarded to manual locks and the control system and the user equipment were combined. Uh, General Dynamics in um, San Diego uh, was our prime and we were a subcontractor then for building a, a set of sets called X, Y, and Z. I invented those days. <laughs> okay, and I put in the proposal and the Air Force bought it and we ended up writing all the specs X, Y, and Z and MAMPAC. Okay, and our, our user sets also were to be aided with the inertial system for increased anti-jam. Now, the, the good thing about the single system that we use, the, I can talk about anti-jam, is that the, the P signal relative to the C signal has about 10 dB more anti jam The P signal by itself has at least 60 dB against an interference signal. And beyond that, if you use inertial, you can get higher numbers. The higher numbers are what you want to get to, somewhere of the order, maybe 100. But that was the most classified part of the whole program. Everything else was basically the clear. All these numbers I gave you, all the designs were publicly available. The reason being, we wanted people to build a lot of GPS sets. Okay, that was the motivation. Uh, we also had a dual frequency for atmospheric correction. We operated at 1575, we also went at 1220. Because if you have two signals, you can figure out what the ionosphere is doing, which you have to operate through. If you didn't, you probably got anywhere from 10 to 30 meters on a bad ionosphere at night or day. Uh, this is the first GPS user equipment called the Exit. Say, well, my God, that's all I saw. <laughs> it was. Uh, this little box right here is a repackaged Hewitt Packer 2100. We didn't have any military computers that did the job we wanted. We had to operate the updates of once a second and do this on five channels. So we in effect stole the commercial mini computer and repackaged it to fly. Uh, this is a control panel. This is a, a test set to, to track and record everything. Uh, this is the RF front end and right here is the base end. This is where we did all the bit flipping. This was basically all the computing of the navigation. Uh, and it, it went in a rack, but it also, most of this equipment went in a fuel tank pot. I'll show you that later. Uh, the Y set looked just like that. The only thing, it, it, we didn't have five channels. We only had one channel that we operated with. Uh, this one's also a one channel set. It's called Z set. Uh, this is about uh, seven by eight. And this chassis and everything fits exactly into a tap end mount. We build it deliberately that way. And we had to build this one to design goal of cost $15,000 per box in 1972 73 technology. So it's all discrete parts. It is digital, but it was built to, in effect, reflect the capability we had at that time. And we're going to build 10,000 of these as a, a development program for, uh, if you will, tankers, transport aircraft, and also the T 33s. Okay, that never happened. There wasn't that money. But this was the first civil. C signal only, one channel, one frequency. And actually, also, the, the tricky thing we did here, we aided it with an altimeter. So we only had about 16 satellites flying. We could operate with three satellites and an altimeter. and still did good navigation. This was a man pack, the very first man pack. Uh, but not a man's back, very like a backpack. Uh, the, the equipment in here is again a repackaged Hewlett Packard. The same base band stuff shrunk down a little bit more. <coughs> the, the battery, the batteries weighed really about at least 10, 15 pounds. So that, that was the first challenge, making better battery. <coughs> but each of these things, you put by the way, we tested. We had 150 different test scenarios that we ran. We tested at Yuma, we tested on the coast of California, we tested in the desert, we tested in the, in the forest, everywhere we go. We tested under helicopter blades just to prove that everything worked. Uh, when we were all done, we said, here's what we think we can do for the next phase. If we go ahead, we can guarantee that we can do this much from the satellite, probably about four meters. Uh, the control segment turned out to really be the best thing of all. We could predict the flight over 90,000 miles within about four meters. That's incredible. <laughs> 
it's one of the most, the actual big challenging thing to do with the column filter is to do this and update a satellite effectively with that accuracy over time. Uh, the user segment was in effect about, well, well, more than that, about five years. It could be guaranteed 6.6. .6. And the goal we set for phase two was better than six meters URD, which meant on the ground anywhere, you're talking about 20 to 30 feet of, of accuracy. This is like a Brad Parkinson accomplishment chart. The program office deserves a lot of this credit. The contractors, the program office, aerospace, even the Navy programs all contributed to make a good effort for the team. Uh, what he really, I think what he really does, he handled, this was a surprise to TRW. When Brad decided to do the program, he said, I don't have enough money to have an integration contract. My 25 captains can handle this job and we'll save all that money. We'll, we will do the integration at the J-Park. And they did. Uh, he had deputy managers for each of the services to reflect our requirements, including the Defense Mapping Agency and the Coast Guard and the FAA. We, we tried to pull in the FAA very, very early. <coughs> Not very well. <laughs> uh, we, we ended up launching off a refurbished Atlas uh, F that was reconditioned. And this was like the stealth segment. We had leftover atlases that were being decommissioned, and those were launch vehicles for all 11 of those phase <coughs> one satellites. Uh, for the next phase, we were going to use Delta, or we were going to go two on a shuttle. Next phase was going to be two on a shuttle. Uh, we also proved that you can do controlled, what we call structured software development. This, this was a challenge. The Air Force threw at me a new spec that they had was how to manage to make sure you don't overrun the software. And they threw this at us, and we ended up doing that. Uh, and they also threw in, <coughs> I said, instead of building all this thing with the computer type language that everybody can't understand once the computers are gone, we want you to do it higher order language, mainly Fortran. Okay, we want something we could read and see what you did. And that's the legacy of what we did for the algorithms. Of course, there was nothing like this available when they gave me the contract. You know, the fortunate thing is that I found a company on the East Coast called Intermetrics that worked on the show, uh, that worked with my Magnavox team to take basically the view of Packer 2100, um, make it capable of having a higher order language, which we call HAL. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's sort of <laughs> we named it after HAL. These are the MIT people, they're kind of strange. <laughs> But, uh, and our motto was, okay, we had one goal, okay, actually two. <laughs> the mission of the program is to drop five drops in the same hole and build a cheap set that navigates and don't you forget it. And that was on the wall. We had that right over the wall as you came into the office and spoke. I also had it at Magnox. Okay, so well, but how, how do we do on that? Uh, okay, this is a test, testing being done at Yuma. Uh, F-4J, flown by a Marine pilot, not an Air Force pilot, Marine pilot, doing bombing with 500 pounds filled with concrete, no explosives. Uh, this fuel tank pod held the exit. Uh, all the navigation computation and the inertial system were here. There was an antenna on the top side of the F-4. Uh, we had about three or four hours of test time we were doing with the satellites coming over. We started out with only one satellite, two satellites, eventually four satellites. And we we're dropping bombs, okay? One, two, three, four. There's a fifth one right about there, and that's the G. And this was the target spot, okay? Five bombs, almost all in the same hole. Now, we had a lot of people say, we don't believe this. So we replaced the Jeep every now and then, said, we put a lawn chair out there and said, if you don't believe it, Sit in the lawn chair. <laughs> <laughs> no baby people took that. <laughs> anyway, that proved to be one. That, that, that was the program solved right there. That sold the program. That led to phase two. Phase two was, a, a, again, competition. The Air Force said, they, uh, I didn't get away with being a sole source. <laughs> uh, I, I was at Magnum. Uh, what they did was they had also already competed in the 
by giving a, a, a missile job for GPS development to TI, Texas Instruments. They also gave a job to Rockwell Collins out of the uh, Wright-Patterson office, which really hurt me, <laughs> to Rockwell Collins. And uh, so we had a competition going between, eventually, Mangalops, Collins, TI, Teledyne, anybody else want to come in phase two? Uh, and at this point, uh, I, I made a big change. I looked down the road and I, I, I had a, a vision that what we want to do is eventually production. In order to do production, we have to deliver 100,000, maybe 150,000 sets per year in the military. Uh, I was at Magabots operating out of a shoe factory. And I looked down the road and I said, this is not going to work. I said, program should probably move to Fort Wayne, which had production capability. Uh, the management at where I worked in Torrance did not agree. So, once I got done with the, the program, I ended up working around. I ended up taking a job with Rockwell Commons. I went to the factory in, in, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, which is out in the middle of farmland. But it's a very <coughs> interesting site. You have this huge amount of acreage of buildings. You have trucks coming in and the sets coming out. At that time, radio sets any other kind of electronics. They have a really excellent reputation and factory. So I, I went with Rockwell Collins to compete against Magulox for this phase. And uh, the challenge was to now build sets that fit exactly and operated by military F-16, B-52, a Navy ASIC attack aircraft, an aircraft carrier, a submarine, a tank, a helicopter, and a smaller man -tank. They had to be all form fit to work, and the military had to maintain them. Uh, eventually, we ended up also winning the initial production contract. Uh, this is an example of that kind of management of equipment. These are all, in effect, standard modules that then fit into all the various vehicles I was talking about. This was the man pack at that time, again, the truck. <laughs> but not like a handheld. Uh, and the displays, and the antennas. Okay, that's like 1983. Uh, at the same time, the, 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 uh, the Air Force now was on the job of trying to build the next generation satellite. Uh, this was what we called the Block 2 and Block 2A. Uh, ended up being launched out of Delta and Delta 2. You say, how did that happen? I thought we were supposed to go on the shuttle. Well, here's the story. Uh, there's a little bit of history about Carter I'll get into it. Basically, in 1986, after the contract had been awarded in 1983, we lost a challenger, okay? And the dictate to stay on, on the shuttle was just too, too much danger in the program. So in 1986, we had a, a, basically a design redefinition, and all of the satellites, in effect, were, in effect changed to go off on a, a Delta II, which had a little bit bumpier rods, not man rating. So it has a little bit of bounces. So we had to go back and redesign a lot of the boxes and, and check the vibration. Uh, the program actually started out very well uh, as a multi-year, we were the first multi-year award. It, it got through DOD. That was quite a job. I spent more time in Washington on that than anything else, trying to convince Senate and Congress people that this is the way to go. If you're going to build something that's 28 satellites, you want to award subcontractors a contract that covers that interval, because it's cheap. Okay, we managed to do that. The only problem was, uh, around 1979, all the FIDEP money got cut in the future. Yeah, we sold a $500 million cut, and the, the whole program was in jeopardy. So the idea was to try to sell, if you will, the, increasing the strategic emphasis and getting the program approved through Congress and funding. Uh, the, the, the phase two history is kind of interesting. It ended up right about here, 1990. Okay, Iraq invades oil fields in Kuwait beginning the Gulf War, uh, and that at the point we had 16 satellites available to operate. Uh, and I said, selective availability goes off. Selective availability was a way of screwing up the civil signal so it wasn't as accurate as the military. Now, since we didn't have 
that many new sets out in the field, we had to turn off the selected mill building, let people operate with whatever they could buy. <laughs> whatever we could provide, whatever they could buy from Trimble or anybody else. And that's what we used, basically, during the uh, Desert Storm. 16 satellites and all the commercial equipment and military you get a hold of. And people were taping little handhelds on the car, the dashboards, and using them to fight that weapon. Anyway, then in 99, we actually that, that, that basically turned it back on again. But President Clinton turned it off eventually. Uh, okay, control segment. Uh, the control segment had a little bit of different history. General Dynamics, who were the incumbent uh, for, for phase one, lost out to IBM in the recompetition for phase two. And, and this is a, the, I wouldn't say it's a symptom, but there's a heritage that's Samsung Space Division that the incumbent never wins. <laughs> you say, well, how'd you learn that? <laughs> well, we just watch all the program histories. Okay? And I, by the way, IBM did an outstanding job. Uh, a fellow, a fellow there that uh, <coughs> brought the uh, control segment up, up to modern computer standards. Uh, they moved it the, the center to Sh uh, Schreiber. Uh, we originally had the monitor station in uh, Vandenberg Air Force, and our, our eventual monitor station in Hawaii Ascension, Hawaii Diego Garcia, and Colorado Springs, and eventually also at, at Vandenberg. Not, no, I'm sorry, at uh, Cape Kennedy. Uh, 1992. Uh, we ended up being awarded the Collier that year. Uh, this is the uh, quotation. <coughs> Most significant development for safe and efficient navigation and surveillance of air and spacecraft since the introduction of radio navigation 50 years ago. The JPO program office in the Air Force, the Naval Research Lab for their contribution to the atomic clocks, the Aerospace Corporation, IBM, Rockwell International, two divisions, <coughs> division, and also uh, Collins, Rockwell Collins. Okay. I credit the, the, the basic efforts here. This was a lot of team, okay? I, I work with not only people in, in our own company, but a lot of the rival teams had damn good ideas. And we used everything we could find. And everybody at that point didn't worry about competition, didn't worry about priority. But the message was kind of like from John Wood. It's amazing what a team can accomplish and do if no one cares about who ends up getting the credit. There were no big patent battles or this is my idea, don't you do that. There was a lot of team effort. That's what made the program a success. Okay, now, I'm not there almost. <laughs> this is going to be a little bit quicker. Uh, this was my conclusion after 40 years. Uh, the program exist. It's run by the military. It's actually stewarded by the Air Force. Okay, it's an element of the United States Air Force. How do you run this thing? <laughs> okay, this was a challenge. Okay, this is a political, military, industrial problem. Uh, and the, the, the problem is we had, if, if you look from phase zero to phase three, we had different people coming into the management offices every three years. Okay? That is not a very good way to run a company. Uh, we also had seven, actually now eight, nine changes of administrations and over 12 terms of Congress. And that's where you have to find the funding. So these are major problems in effect having a continuity of a system that became basically a, a utility. We're like a power company. We provide the power, you plug in. Okay? How do you run a company? Uh, well, we need some policy <laughs> And the first one I'd like to address is this one, 1983, President Ronald Reagan. We had the, I don't know if you remember the, the incident over Korean Airlines flying over an edge of Russia being shot down by the Russians. Okay, 1983. Uh, with that event, Reagan made a, if you will, an offer saying, hey, the reason this thing failed was a bad update to our commercial system. We have this GPS, and we'll let you use it for basically free. And I have a gentleman here, Bob Lee. I give, give Ed a break. Yeah. Give Ed a break for a minute. Uh, 
I'm Bob Lilac, and at the time in, when uh, President Reagan made this decision, this is Mike on, by the way? Yep. Uh, I was a colonel in the Air Force after having spent 25 years flying as a fighter pilot and a test pilot. And uh, I was stuck at, uh, in Washington working on the Reagan, in the Reagan White House as uh, a colonel on the National Security Council staff. Well, Ed, uh, Ed gets a lot of credit for the development of the GPS. I think it's fantastic. And he and Brad Parkinson did a fantastic job along with all of his geniuses. But the guy that you really get credit for, you and I, having it on our cell phones and in our golf carts, is a Russian a Soviet fighter pilot flying a Su-15 by name of Gennady Osipovich. And he shot down Korean airliner 007 with 269 people on board and killed them all. Really pissed off Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan made the decision at that time to, in reaction to that to do a whole bunch of things. And one of the things that he decided to do in response to a task force that I was chairing along with Ali North at the White House was to do a bunch of things in reaction and one was to shut down Aeroflot in the United States and the other parts of it included a whole bunch of uh, different kinds of reactions one of which Reagan asked a question to us on the task force how the hell did the airliner get lost? And we tried to explain it to him about autopilot and INS and it was in a heading hold mode and it switched over to to the INS mode a little late, and there was too many of a differential. Long story short, the airplane flew over Kamchatka Peninsula, then flew, started to go out of Soviet airspace over Sakhalin Island, and the Russian hierarchy, the people at the command post were getting excited, and they ordered Gennady Osipovich to shoot the airplane down. After that was done, our answers back to Ronald Reagan was, well, we have this system that Ed Martin and Brad Parkinson are developing called GPS currently only used for the military. Ronald Reagan made that decision the 16th of September 1983, two weeks after the shoot down, to make it available when it's fully developed to civilian use. And the rest of that's history for all of us, and it'll take on to that history now. The rest of these are the various presidential decisions that were made along the way. No, no fees, uh, eventually had President, uh, at that point, I think it was uh, Bush, said we're going to end select availability. Uh, in effect, also, uh, it was agreed to by. Uh, yeah. the, the next issue was the uh, fact of agreement on Galileo, which is a, a, a Russian, uh, not a Russian, but a European system that we work with them with a common signal. And a new national space policy came out by uh, President Obama. Uh, this is a description of the bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> the president's right there. Now, uh, we have all the representations of the various departments, uh, mainly defense and transportation. Uh, there's a national coordination office director. It's a Colonel Harold Martin, no relative, but doing a good job. And uh, a lot of advisory boards and committees. The buyers, advisory board here, interestingly, has uh, ex-defense secretary Schlesinger, with a co-chair by Brad Parkinson. So Brad's still in the game, big time. Uh, the one I'd like to show you, though, is the next chart. This is the real boss of GPS today now, okay? General William Shelton, he's commander of Space Command, and he's the guy that basically is the czar. And he's the one also that did all the fighting and made sure White Square and stayed off of our frequency. Uh, this, by, uh, this is the team right now that deserves all the credit. These are the people right now that are in effect procured, acquired, and developed the system that's running right now. It's called the GPS Director. It operates out of El Segundo at LA Air Force Station. Uh, this is the second space operations squad operating out of the, uh, the mountain of Colorado. They, in effect, control and monitor and upload all of the GPS signals. And these about 100 people here, about 150 people here, military people, low contractor support, but this is really run by Bill Shelton, who's doing an outstanding job. Uh, this is where we're going, kind of. Uh, this is where we were right here. I told you about Block 1, Block 2. Uh, block 2R and 2RM, this is the syndrome of Space Division. <laughs> This is the incumbent. This is the new guy on the block that won the next contract. 
they, in effect, have built uh, 20 vehicles, of which about 12 of those are currently operating right now. They're at the backbone right now of the system. My old satellites are all dying off, and they're still flying. Uh, Lockheed Martin here, actually it was General Electric, but got bought out by GE, got sold to Lockheed Martin. <laughs> The next competition came up was 2F. It was right before I retired, and we ended up managing to win that. Uh, we built 12 satellites, of which five are flying right now. And the next competitor is Lockheed Martin. So, badang, 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 badang. The incumbent never wins. <laughs> uh, the new things about all this right now, uh, the, the Block 2R flew the same signals we did. Uh, the Block 2RM added two military codes and a signal on L2C. Uh, the Block 2F added an L5 signal at a new frequency for civil users. And the Block uh, uh, 3 basically has a new civil signal again to replace the uh, L1C or CA. Uh, today's status right now, this chart's not, not current. <laughs> okay, as of Thursday, uh, I have four Block 2F satellites that launch. I'll rest of them in the number five, successfully. It's going to replace number 38 in Orbit. So I only have seven Block 2As left. Those are my old birds. Uh, Lockheed's got 12 Block 2R and seven Block 2RMs. So they're the backbone right now. And these are the next ones. But there's actually 12 of these ordered. And we're going to deliver seven more eventually. Uh, next launch will be May and June. Two more launches this year, which is kind of incredible because the sequester screwed up the launch sequence. There wasn't enough money to get the birds off the ground. So getting one off uh, this last Thursday was a work of art. <laughs> okay. Coming soon. Uh, this is one of my last new uh, We have now a thing called the Global Navigation Satellite Systems, GNSS. And we got satellites built by uh, Russia. We got satellites built by uh, China. We got satellites built by the US. We got satellites built by India and Japan. Okay, we got a lot of satellites going. Okay, what does it look like? I try to summarize this, but it got to be too many numbers, so I kind of put it down this way. This is the current status. We have two frequencies for civil mainly right now. L5 can be a civil signal. L2s are civil signals, and it has a military signal on there now also. And L1, this is our GPS. We have L5, L2, and L1 with both C slash A and a new L1C that's compatible with all of these other satellites. So we have the universal signal coverage. The real key question in getting that done is everybody going to have the same clock? That's why I showed the picture with the conductor. He's got to make everybody play on the same page. Okay, that's a challenge internationally. Okay, GLONASS. GLONASS has been flying uh, signals uh, that look like this. this is a frequency now. <coughs> signals. They operate across a wide band of frequencies. It makes the receiver a little bit more costly. So they're finally going now and using our conventional, what we call CDMA, code division multiple access, operate on one frequency, have many satellites. Galileo is the European Union's attempt to get into business. Uh, they're planning to launch a, a total of eventually 30 satellites. <coughs> uh, I'll, I'll do this one last. Uh, the, uh, India right now is planning to put up seven satellites operating in our band and also at L5. And Japan has a quasi-Zenith system of three satellites. So if you add all these up, in the coming years, I get 129. That's a hell of a lot of signals in space. Okay, if you try to put, if you pipe all those satellites with all their signals, you get like 830 satellites to put on your telephone. Okay, uh, somewhere this is gonna have to be managed and changed. Because I'll tell you right now, putting a satellite up, basically it costs you $25,000 a pound, okay? And that's the price of gold at 16 ounces. That's basically the best metric I have for what does this cost. So all these satellites figure out their weight and multiply by $25,000, and you know what we're investing in space. Uh, there's some other new stuff going on. You probably will hear about this eventually. This, if you fly, anybody here fly? <laughs> Guess what? We have next gen. Next gen satellites are going to be replacing all of the radar network. There's 300 of these already using what we call the automatic dependent surveillance broadcast network. 
You're going to have to buy a new box, guys. You're going to have to tell where you are using GPS to tell everybody else where you are. And they will tell you where they are. This is being funded by the FAA. It's been running into a little bit of schedule and funding problems. <coughs> uh, now the new challenge is also unmanned aircraft vehicles. Did you see the picture in the paper two days ago with the drone? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you heard about Amazon.com delivering your house with a drone? This is coming. Unmanned aircraft vehicles, drones. They have to be integrated into this system by 2015. That's one year from now. So currently we're doing six tests to figure out how and who controls the drones. If you're doing it line of sight or if you're doing it over the horizon, you have to get a license and how do you get an effect certified? It's coming to your neighborhood whether you like it or not. Okay, uh, to back up all this, there's a, 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 actually a, a private idea to use it as security backup, enhance the ELORAN. The ELORAN won't come back. It's already in England. They're using it for maritime because they're worried what happens if somebody decides to blow all this stuff up. Uh, vehicle to vehicle communications for auto safety. Uh, this is also going to be funded by the Department of Transportation. Does anybody remember IVHS? Okay, crazy names. Integrated Vehicle Highway System. I worked on this also. <laughs> this is the idea where we have a GPS and it tells and you're from your vehicle to the other vehicle where you are, and they tell you where they are. So this is basically next gen for, in effect, auto safety. You say, why do we worry about auto safety? Because driverless cars are coming. Uh, anybody know about Google? You ever heard of Google? Okay, Google has made a deal with every car company in the world to have driverless cars. Okay, you can now drink and drive and text and not work. <laughs> <laughs> but it's gonna, it's, gonna, it's gonna cost you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean insurance wise, it's gonna cost you for a lot of sensors. You have to have both optical mapping and a lot of other things going on. Which by the way, by 2020, uh, Brad is guaranteed this. Brad Parkinson, and uh, I, I may or may not agree with him. Uh, the last one is, uh, Commercial carriers are going to be placed in single pilot or remote pilot guns with NSAs working on robotics for commercial aircraft. So when you fly the friendly skies, it's probably a robot. Okay? And last but not least, the Internet of Everything. Okay? This was presented at the last conference in Las Vegas. And this is a view of the world by Dr. James Kent. And what this is, are, these are basically, he calls domains. These are human activities. This is what we do. Okay, these are human activities. These are, in effect, sensors <coughs> or networks or infrastructure. And all these have to communicate with each other and eventually to everybody. It's called the Internet of Everything, and that's the new big thing. If you want to look at activities and investments, this is the place. But by the way, stabilized by GPS for both location and time. The end. Thank you.